In this video, we're going to take a look at a commercially available version of CPM that ran on the Altair 8800 configured with the original Altair floppy drives. Now this version came out in 1980. It was distributed by a company called Lifeboat Associates. Lifeboat was known for porting CPM to a wide variety of machines at the time, and obviously they ported it to the Altair as well. Now, CPM was never part of the actual Altair product line for a couple of reasons. One, Altair DOS was intended to be the operating system of choice if you purchased an Altair. But number two was timing. By the time CPM came out and was really becoming popular, this example for this version, for example, is 1980. Some of the others came out in 1979 for the Altair. The Altair product line had actually already been canceled. In the summer of 1978, the Altair computer line was no longer manufactured and or sold. So right about the time the Altair was dying out, CPM was taken off and it was really never um, part of the product line. However, there were enough users out there with Altairs that companies like Lifeboat obviously saw a need to go ahead and port CPM to the Altair to support that existing user base. And so that's what we're going to take a look at here today. All right, to boot CPM is the same procedure as booting Altair DOS or BASIC. I'm going to turn on our computer and reset it. We're going to go to 177400. That's the address of the disk bootloader ROM. Let's examine that location and we see what's there. That sets the PC to the disk bootloader and now we can hit run. That's all there is to it. We don't have to set the sense switches because CPM doesn't even look at those. CPM, uh, this particular version, is hard coded to use the two SIO boards for I.O. on the console. All right, so let's take a look over here at the boot message, the welcome message we get from CPM. Let's see if I can focus this a bit. All right. In the boot message that comes up after a cold start, CPM tells us what version it is. Here we're at version 2.2. If you've ever played with CPM, there's a good chance that the version you used was 2.2. It saw the most copies distributed. It was at the right place at the right time, so it was kind of the de facto version. Now the version before this, 1.4, was the previous release that was really widely distributed. It really marked the start of the CPM era. That was the first version that was sold directly to end customers and really got CPM taking off. All right, also what we see here is a size and mem a memory size. This is not like BASIC or Altair DOS where it sized the computer. It's actually the other way around. You had to have CPM be the right size or configured, I should say, for the right size of memory that was going to be or that is present in your system. So if you had 48K of RAM in your system, you needed to buy a version of CPM that was cisgened, it was called, for 48K of memory. Um, our system, we've got plenty of RAM, uh, some ROM up at the top, so we're using a 59K version of CPM. We'll explain why that has to be in a later video. All right, now in CPM, drives are referred to by a letter instead of a number. So in Altair, DOS, and BASIC, we had drive 0, 1, and 2, for example. In CPM, they're going to be A, B, and C. So here we see in the prompt, A is part of the prompt. That tells us that the default drive is currently drive A. And what the default drive does is save us from having to specify that in commands. So for example, if I want to do a directory, I type DIR and hit return, it will default to drive A. I could look at drive B, but I'd have to specify that. The drive designation for B is the drive letter B followed by a colon. And now I see what's on drive B. And I could do the same and see what's on drive C. Now you can actually change the default drive just by typing the drive name followed by a colon. Now you see the prompt has a new default drive letter. Do a directory there, and now I'm seeing what's on B. Now if this all looks awfully familiar, even though you've never used CPM, the reason is because MS-DOS borrows so heavily from CPM in its design. So even if you haven't used CPM, you're going to recognize a lot of this because of how heavily MS-DOS borrowed. Alright, so let's go back to drive A and look at this directory again. What we see here is that we have eight character file names and three character extensions. Again, right into MS-DOS. The extensions aren't heavily enforced, but they tell us roughly what kind of file it is. The COM extension is one of those that is actually enforced. That's a loadable file. CPM itself looks for that whenever you uh, run a program. We'll get into that in just a second. All right. Um, CPM is case insensitive, just like MS-DOS, both in file names and in commands. So I can type the directory command in lowercase, and it also works. 
and we have destructive backspace just like we're used to in MS-DOS and in newer um, user interfaces as well. All right, the file names again are also case insensitive. So for example, let's say I want to look at this file demo.txt. That is just a text file and we can use the command from uh, CPM called type to look at a text file. So I'm typing the type command in lowercase and I'm going to specify the file name in lowercase, demo.txt. You'll see that it finds it and displays the content of that file even though um, we did it in lowercase. So completely case insensitive just like DOS. MS-DOS I should say. Alright, the commands we've done so far, the dir command and the type command, those are both commands built right into CPM. They're intrinsic commands it doesn't have to go out and load a program in order to run it. A couple of other intrinsic commands are the rename command. So, for example, if I wanted to rename demo.txt and call it, um, I've already got a demo too, let's call it test.txt. You can use rename, R-E-N, put in the new name, test.txt, say that equals the old name. And then now we can do a directory and we see demo.txt became test.txt. So that's the rename command. To delete files, it's the erase command, which is ERA. And again, you just specify the file name, test.txt. And now if we do a directory, we see that it's gone. It was right in between these two. All right, so that's the delete command is erase. Um, CPM also introduced for us on the microcomputer world wildcards, made life much easier, so I could do a directory of, let's say, everything that starts with a P and see just those. And, and wildcards work for a number of other commands as well. So that made life easy. So the flexibility here you can see compared to like Altair, DOS, and, and BASIC, it's just much easier to use. And what's really important now is when we run out of these intrinsic commands, how does CPM expand itself? Or how do you add programs from other users. Well, anything you type that it is not a command, it goes to the default drive and looks for that as a com file. So for example, one of the commands that came with um, CPM was the stat command. This was used to get a feel for the I.O. devices on your system. Stat is actually just a program sitting out here. So when you type stat, it looks, that's not an intrinsic command, so it then goes to drive A and looks for anything spelled stat and then it adds a .com to it. It finds it, so it loads that into memory and runs it. So for example, you'll notice there's quite a delay here in the beginning. That's where it's loading stat into memory, and now it runs it. Stat right here is showing us how much space is on each of the drives we've accessed. It could also show you things about your serial ports for the console and terminals. It's just a useful program that came with CPM, but it's just a program. There's all sorts of programs that anybody under the sun could write and they'd run just the same way. But let's take a look at one or two other programs that were technically a common part of CPM. What, you've, what we haven't seen here is the ability to copy files. How would I copy a file from one point to another? That's not a built-in command. Instead, it's this pip program. Pip um, can be run by itself where it comes up just to a command prompt. We'll see that here in a second or you can specify commands on the command line. So for example, if I want to copy, let's copy demo2 and make a copy, let's put demo back in there. So I say pip demo.txt equals demo2.txt. So it'll take demo2, copy it in to demo. It takes a bit to load pip. Now pip is running doing the copy and then it'll return to CPM here. So one handy thing that we've noticed here is we can run a program by specifying its name, but the parameters that you might specify out next to the command name, those also get passed to the program so they can be used. So now if you look, you can see that uh, we've got our demo program in here because Pip put it in there for us. And you can also copy it to other disks. For example, I could copy, um, let's copy that program over to drive C. You could say C demo.txt equals demo.txt. So this is going to take the one on A, copy it over to the one over to drive C. And again, since pip is a program, it takes a bit longer to run. When you see it do that line feed, that's when it's finally actually running. Now pip is doing the copy between the two drives, and then it'll eventually return here. Now pip can copy 
anything to anything. It's an amazingly flexible program. It can copy a file to a terminal, copy a terminal to a file, files to files, wildcards, whole disks, the whole work. So that's a whole program that by itself could take up a whole video. But anyway, let's take a look at drive C and you'll see that that demo.txt file is out there now somewhere. There it is right there. Or we could do a shortcut and say let's take a look at drive C. Um, anything that starts with a D as in demo See, there's dump DT, and there's our demo. It's very, very flexible and, and easy to use. All right, now, one thing you've probably noticed as we do these directories is that it's not sorted and it's kind of hard to find things. Well, one of the first things people did is go out and write a better directory program. One on this computer I use called ls. ls comes from the Unix world, it means basically do a list of the files. You see, it's, it's sorted. It puts it all in the columns and it sorts it. Another nice thing it does is it shows us how big every one of them is and at the end it tells us how much space we have. So LS is just a great program to use instead of DIR. Do you see how easy it was though? That is what made CPM take off. You now had an environment where anybody could write a program. John Doe and Peoria could write an LS program and anybody with CPM could run it. MS, excuse me, yeah, CPM could add commands just by including them as files on the disk that came with the distribution. It made it very easy to distribute programs and run them. And if your program used standard I.O. that was provided by CPM, for example, standard disk I.O., standard terminal I.O., standard printer I.O., then your program would run on anybody's CPM computer, even if it had a different disk drive, a different controller, a different serial port, etc because CPM provided the hardware abstraction to hide that from the programs. Inside CPM was a um, essentially device drivers as we call them today, but a BIOS, a basic input output system that hid the hardware layer from all the programs. And that BIOS was then custom configured to all the different hardware formats that are out there. But suddenly we've got the ability to develop programs with assemblers and compilers that now anybody could run. And after this, the programs available for the computer just took off and exploded, which of course then made CPM also extremely popular and then fed right back into selling more computers. So this snowball just took off with the introduction of CPM. All right, in the next video, we're going to go ahead and see how a program was written in CPM, what kind of environment it had to run in, why CPM needed to be specified in terms of how big without a 48K version, things like that. And uh, that will help us understand a little bit about the technical aspects of how things ran in CPM. All right, now the computer used in the video today is actually an Altair 8800 clone computer. This computer accurately duplicates the look and feel, the features and performance and the limitations of a real Altair, but it does it with modern hardware on the inside. That way you don't have to worry about damaging a vintage computer or museum quality computer when you run all these fun exercises we're looking at. You can just go right for it and not have to worry about damaging anything and since it's modern hardware it's going to work. You don't have to sit there trying to figure out how to get that computer to come up and run again. Be sure to visit AltairClone.com to learn more about this great computer. Spend some time learning about this great period in computing history as well.